My name's Steve, I'm uh, 74 years old and I'm a retired engineer. Uh, I've been a Christian now for 50, see, 53 years. I have a lovely wife that I've been married to for 49 years, two children, a son and a daughter, and two wonderful grandchildren. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I noticed a bit of an accent there. Um, mm. where, where are you from originally? Originally from England. Um, I came out here when I was five, when my family uh, immigrated uh, a few years after the Second World War. Mm. Whereabouts did you move into in Sydney? Mm. Uh, we, uh, well, uh, it's an interesting tale. We came on a ship and uh, we docked uh, one evening in uh, Sydney. We got put on a, a double-decker bus, one of the really old ones. They were all old then. <laughs> and uh, dr we drove, it seemed forever, through the night until we came to a, a converted army camp out along Heathcote Road, not far from here in Engadine. And uh, uh, there we were shown our new home, which was half a... Uh, Quonset huts. Some of you may know them as Nissan huts. They're those corrugated iron huts that are semicircular. And uh, half of one of those was our new home, which was generous because later arrivals only got a quarter. Mm. Um, so that was our home for the first, uh, I think it was two years. Right. Yeah. How, how many siblings did you uh, have? One brother, mm -hmm. um, one sister. My sister was the eldest and I was the uh, youngest. Right. We came successively after the war was over and dad was back from the, his army service. Right. And so you moved here and, and stayed here? Mm. Uh, well, yes. Uh, 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 dad had to get a job, but jobs, there was full employment then and he was a very good upholsterer, so he soon got work. Mm. Uh, Mum stayed with us. We arrived in October, so she stayed with us um, until uh, the school year started the following year. And once we were settled in school, she had to get work as well. Uh, you needed more than one income to, uh, you know, to have enough to find a home of your own and move off the uh, migrant hostel. Right. So uh, my older sister, who was nine, would uh, look after the boys and shepherd us off to school, make sure we had breakfast and, and everything. And that's the way we did things. Mm. What was your early years in school like, or just your whole schooling experience uh, like? Uh, I think I was fairly shy uh, in those early years, and um, but I mean I, I generally enjoyed school. Uh, I was very good at maths and uh, anything to do with science and the like. So uh, um, yeah, I got on quite well. When I was probably eight or nine, uh, we moved to Helensburg, which is not that far from here, though it was considered really out in the bush in those days. Still is by many. And mum and dad had saved up enough for a deposit on an old house there. And so we moved uh, to this semi-rural environment and went to the local school there. Uh, and I did quite well there. Um, you know, I was, as I say, very good at maths and science. And um, uh, I generally was given jobs to keep me busy. <laughs> so that, uh, uh, like running the school duplicator. That was one of my specialties there. What, what's a duplicator? A oh, duplicator. <laughs> oh, this is old technology. The precursor of a photocopier. Oh, So okay. worksheets for the kids, right. hand-cranked machine. It's a very functional name, right? Duplicator. A duplicator, yeah. that's right. Yes. And um, so generally I enjoyed it, did very well. Uh, I learned the joys of reading um, in those years. Almost entirely uh, non-fiction. I, I loved reading books on things like the history of ships, steam engines, trains. Um, the first book I can remember was read to us by our teacher and it was called They Put Out to Sea. It was a history of the early uh, uh, Portuguese explorers, mm. Vasco da Gama and Bartolomeo Diaz and their voyages to find the, uh, you know, the, well, the, the southern part of Africa and further around to India. And that, that fascinated me. Mm. But I did learn other books too. Um, I did actually, by the time I got to high school, read fiction, and uh, including Biggles, for those that know Biggles. <laughs> this is really old stuff. This now. is old, this is beyond <laughs> <old laughs> <stuff>. my time. <laughs> Biggles, the famous aviator and uh, hero. You know, so, um, what else can I say? 
I didn't like sports. My father was a great sportsman. I've still got certificates of his from winning the 100 metres here and the 200 metres there. And, and he loved soccer. Uh, but I didn't inherit any no, of that. Did any of your siblings? No. no? Didn't stick. You passed the generation. <laughs> Could I just throw in something here? Mm. It's interesting to me. We're just about to start the, uh, the FIFA Women's World Cup mm -hmm. uh, events in Australia here. And uh, I think people have the idea that women's soccer is some novelty. Mm. My uh, mother and father met at a dance held by the soccer club after her team, the team she played in. So your mum played soccer? The team my mum played in, the, uh, the women's soccer team from Beaujet in England, were playing against the women's team from, um, where was it? Newport Pagnell? I might have got that wrong. Anyway, that was dad's club. Yep. Uh, they were only in their 20s, probably even in their late teens. And uh, she spied this uh, tall, handsome guy that looked a bit like Errol Flynn. And she said to her friends, he's mine. <laughs> and anyway, uh, they got married after the war started and um, dad was then shipped overseas mm -hmm. um, and uh, spent most of the war overseas working, uh, fighting in the 8th Army, mm. uh, the British 8th Army. So it's not new. Mm. Women's soccer has yeah. a long history. Not a, not a novel sport. It goes back yeah. before the Second World War at wow. least. But I didn't inherit in any of that. No, okay. <laughs> um, I did inherit mum's love of reading, uh, of uh, poetry, of uh, art to a, yep, to a fair extent, mm. uh, whereas dad would really only read the newspaper. Right, okay. Because yeah. I, I know you're an avid reader and, mm. Um, mm. and that's what, I guess, marked some of your, your uni time, mm. right? Just um, yes. a love of reading and exploring new things. So... Uh, Tell us a bit about your, your uni experience. Right. U university for those who aren't from Australia. Yep, university. <laughs> uh, well, first off, I was only, I'd only just turned 17 when I went to university. Um, in those days, the uh, high school course was only five years. There was no year, uh, there was no uh, year 12. We, we had first form, which was the first year of high school, and then up to fifth form and a thing called the leaving certificate. So we had a shorter term um, of high school. Um, I was doing very well and uh, I did very well in the exams at the end, but I could have done better. Mm. Uh, what, what degree were you, were you studying? What course were you studying? Oh, sorry, I'm talking about high school. Oh, high yeah. school, right. Yes, high school. Uh, I could have done better, but I was getting distracted. Uh, it, it was, I suppose, life, the universe and everything. Mm. Uh, I was reading, a, all manner of things, including uh, Bertrand Russell, a famous 20th century mathematician and mm -hmm. philosopher, uh, and one who was very, what can I say, very clear at explaining things, didn't believe that there could be any God, and, and that influenced me. Mm -hmm. I read uh, a lot of, uh, I think almost everything that H.G. Wells ever wrote, uh, the one who wrote The War of the Worlds mm -hmm. and The Time Machine and lots of other things, but he was I think very pessimistic mm. uh, and he would have had a similar philosophy I think to that of Bertrand Russell. Mm. So I sort of imbibed these things without fully realising uh, uh, you know, what they were uh, but it made me do a lot of thinking mm. and I can remember thinking about the, the stars of the solar system and the vastness of it and just thinking you know, you know where do we all fit in mm. you know, not feeling at home uh, and that was only as a boy, at a, uh, as a boy of about fifteen. So uh, it was, it was a challenging time. And then there were cars. Uh, I got my first car when I was before I was even old enough to have a, a learner's permit. Uh, I, I didn't drive it on the road, but uh, that that was a foolishness. But still, I'm sure many others will repeat that. Uh, I had my first girlfriend while I was at high school and so there were lots of distractions so mm. I could have done better. Mm. Um, uh, there were some uh, advanced courses and, which I started in maths and science and I dropped out of it because it was too much work. So at the end of that time university it just seemed natural that I'd go to university and uh, I 
started a course in mining engineering. Okay. Helensburg has a coal mine. Right. right. And um, so there was, I suppose, that, that bit of a culture there. Yeah. And um, I got a cadetship with the uh, New South Wales Mines Department uh, because it wasn't free education and so they paid for things. Uh, I did reasonably well in that first year, but again, I got, was getting distracted. Same thing is only magnified a bit. I joined a student protest group um, of uh, rather left-wing origins. <laughs> um, I explored not only atheism, but also communism. And uh, uh, with that, knowing all exactly what it was, existentialism, I read people like uh, Albert Camus, mm. and uh, I can't remember whether I read the other one, John Paul Sartre or not. But these are all things going on in the midst of a very busy engineering course. I don't know whether it's like that now, but in all the engineering disciplines at the University of New South Wales, where I was, uh, in the first year then, we all did a common course, which was really just uh, mathematics, chemistry, physics, and well, there must have been something else. <laughs> there were four of them. And we were all herded into uh, a, a huge uh, lecture theatre to begin with at the beginning of our year. And uh, somebody explained to us what will be expected of us as engineering students and, and so on. And I remember having it explained that there were 168 hours in a, a week, mm -hmm. which is true, but I'd never thought about it before. And that uh, there were 30 hours face to face at the university in lectures, uh, tutorials, uh, laboratory work and so on. Um, there were so many hours allotted for sleep, for f eating, traveling, uh, you know, washing and, and so on. And at the end of that, we had two hours left. Mm -hmm. So that was... <laughs> that was for you. Two hours free time. Yep. <laughs> so because we were expected to do put at least two hours in for every hour face to face. Mm. So it was quite a challenging prospect and a, a little bit, uh, what's the word, uh, disappointing. Mm. So I, I, I got through it all right. I, I got credits, which was a, a good but not excellent result. Uh, started in second year, but by that time I'd run out of, uh, I suppose, um, enthusiasm for it. You know, what's life all about? Why am I studying to be a mining engineer? And, uh, and so I envied my art student friends who only had about 15 hours face to face <laughs> and um, mixed with them quite a bit and gradually moved into uh, what was then Sydney's uh, fledgling hippie subculture. Uh, by the time I got to the second term, I decided to drop out, which I did. And um, again, it was the, you know, the search for something in life. I wasn't satisfied. I needed to know, you know who I really was, why I'm here. Mm. And uh, nothing I'd read so at that point, to that point, gave me any answers to that at all. So you know, the hippie movement with its uh, uh, emphasis on psychedelic uh, drugs, which could you know, change your mind, mm. uh, its emphasis on uh, uh, turning over the old traditions in everything uh, seemed attractive. But, uh, and it was for a while, but I also learnt quickly enough that you still need to eat and therefore you still need to work. <laughs> um, I had a number of jobs as a male nurse in a psychiatric hospital. That was certainly educational. Um, I worked for a company re repairing cash registers. Now, hardly anybody out there will understand what a cash register is, but still. There's still a few, a few places. Oh, well, you know, only a like, museum, but, surely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah. These were all mechanical. They're nothing like the modern computerized uh, cash drawer. And we don't even use the cash much now. Mm -hmm. But um, that was interesting. Um, and from there, I went on and joined a, a computer company and uh, in the early days of IT. And uh, I was uh, a repair technician. Uh, again, thoroughly enjoyed it and was doing quite well at it, but still the same nagging problems. So uh, that's sort of roughly it. I did go back later. Uh, that's a later part of the story, which we'll probably get to. Mm -hmm. But um, um, you know, major things had to happen first. Right. Let me just go back a little bit. Hmm. Um, 
Was your family a, a Christian religious family? What was their, I guess, religious affiliations? Ah, uh, loose. Um, we certainly had a, uh, a church connection back in England. Um, but, uh, and, and we as children in England were sent to what I guess amounted to Sunday school. I can remember, but mum and dad didn't come with us then. Before the war, dad had uh, uh, been a choir boy. He was a boy soprano till the age of 21. And uh, Did you inherit that, that voice? Not the soprano. No. <laughs> I, could, I could generally keep in tune. Okay. But, yeah. And uh, his love of uh, music such as Handel's Messiah eventually passed down to me, but mm -hmm. not for a long time. Right. That was all old stuff. Yeah, so I was going to say. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but no, I wouldn't have said a strong church connection. Mm. Certainly the upheaval of coming to Australia pretty well obliterated that. Right. And uh, the need to make a home and you know, all the pressures that people have today in the same way. You know, having enough money to, uh, to, to get a home of your own, to raise your children and so on. Mm. So that sort of pushed that aside. Right. Mm. And so you, you pretty much stumbled on the, I guess, more of these existential questions about mm. meaning of life and mm. the purpose of life. Um, would you say that you stumbled on that by yourself? And, yes. And you just started asking questions when you were 15 <laughs> years old? And yes, certainly by that age, yeah. yes. Yes. Wow. So in senior high school and, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then that carried through to your mm. uni, university yes. years. Yes. Yeah. And, and so what was the progression like? I mean, you, you mentioned that you've been a, you've been a Christian for decades. Mm. How did you come across Christianity? Well, let me think. I suppose I was in the, that, uh, that's what I call the fledgling hippie subculture. I mean, it was countercultural then. Mm. Uh, a lot of the things that made it countercultural are now just part of our culture, but then it was countercultural. Uh, you know, uh, a sort of, uh, I suppose, a, a natural uh, socialism within it, where everyone looked after everyone else. So it, that was the ideal, anyway. And um, that has started to come apart a little bit, certainly for me individually. But I think generally the optimism had started to uh, wilt a little bit. Uh, the world wasn't going to change. Uh, uh, our views of things didn't really make us better people. Um, so that was certainly you know, an obvious thing. And uh, um, so there, there was a sort of fracturing of, of some relationships there. So that was one thing. Uh, the second was the, the need to uh, earn a living. And um, for a number of reasons, I'd actually moved back to my parents' home in Engadine. And I'd, I'd taken up a, a love of motorcycles. And um, I ended up uh, buying an old Harley Davidson off a guy that said he was a hell's angel. Whether he really was, we don't know. But anyway, I had this uh, motorcycle that was sort of in working order, but only just. And I started to restore it. And I was going to make it into a, a chopper, as they're called, um, you know, with lots of chrome and, and big Are those tires one of those yep. motorbikes with the really yeah, yep, tall yep, handles? Yeah, yep, yep. they look really I had comfortable. Delusions <laughs> of grandeur there. And um, so that soaked up nearly all my time, spare time, and also nearly all my spare money, which wasn't very much. Um, anyway, so uh, you know, buying parts, getting things chrome-plated, restoring this bit, and, and so on. And uh, therefore, I didn't uh, go out as much. And uh, so my connections with my hippie fraternity was a little bit looser, mm. I would call it there. So what do you do with yourself to distract your mind from all the problems and questions of life? Uh, I liked reading and I liked reading science fiction. So I went to the local library and would get books and read again, which I hadn't done for a while. So I took up a lot of reading. I stumbled one day upon a book in the library. It was an anthology, a collection of stories that had to do with the planet Venus. And um, 
I knew most of the authors of these stories, but there was one I'd never heard of, and uh, it was a fragment of a book called Perilandra, and I was entranced by it. I thought it was wonderful writing. And so I went back to try and find anything I could by the same author. It was so interesting and, and absorbing. The author's name was uh, C.S. Lewis, and um, the only book I could find in the library with his name on it was an anthology of his writings. So uh, one anthology led me to another. All his fictional writings were out at the time. So I took this one home. It was called A Mind Awake. And it was extracts from all his books arranged in topics, and uh, including about God and the meaning of life and all manner of things. And uh, I read this with enthusiasm, I suppose. I was just so impressed, among other things, with his clarity of, uh, of uh, writing. I, I still feel that he's able to express in one sentence what would take me a paragraph or two or three, and probably wouldn't be as clear anyway. So I was quite taken with this man and his writings. So from there I began to read more of his uh, uh, things. I'm sure I read the uh, Mere Christianity, where he sets out the case for you know, a common uh, base of Christianity, regardless of any denominations and things like that. And uh, uh, his screw tape letters, which are a classic where he has a, uh, a, a senior devil tempter called Screwtape, mm. who's writing to his nephew on his first assignment and uh, telling him how to, how to manipulate his patient, a human. And that was full of interesting stuff. Among other things, uh, uh, the suggestion that uh, he, he'd try and keep the, the patient from going to church. Mm. And later on when he had, you know, from taking the Bible seriously and things like this. So this weighed upon me and um, I, uh, I just absorbed all this and it just seemed to be so right. Mm. So somewhere in Lewis's writings, he he made the statement, or one of his characters made the statement, that it was foolishness to dismiss the Bible without having read it. And that struck me right between the eyes. So after some uh, wrestling with myself, and the risk of embarrassment, I entered a religious bookshop and asked for a Bible, bought a, a Bible and took it home and began to read it. Um, I suppose it possibly natural, but I, I read it in a rather legalistic way and, uh, and tried to make myself better. Mm. So you read is, it like a, 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 law of, a book of morals? A book of morals, mm. yes. A book of moral instruction mm. of things that were right. And my, my mind said, yes, they are right. There are things good and right and fair uh, and just. It's not just, uh, you know, I make my own rules, you make your rules and who cares? Uh, which was the ethos of the movement that I'd come out of. You know, everything's relative and obviously is a cultural ethos around the world now in the West. Uh, you must be yourself. Uh, you make your own rules. Um, uh, fulfill your own potential, whatever that means. Um, but here were absolutes and I accepted them uh, and tried to live up to them. But I found I couldn't. Mm. And so it gradually dawned on me from reading both Lewis and the Bible that it was only uh, faith in Jesus that could do that, that could make the change. Mm. I didn't understand how, but frankly, I still don't. Mm. But why, why should one man, even the most exalted man, the Son of God, why should his death uh, have any effect on me? Mm. Uh, well, I'm not sure that anyone can really explain it, mm. but we can accept it mm. and we can experience it. Mm. So uh, eventually um, I decided I had to, I should be praying and I should be going to church. Um, the praying came first. I remember thinking I should pray. So I'll pray on Sundays because that seemed to be the right day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I, the thought you know, came to me, Again, I think prompted by one of Lewis's characters that, that I should go to church and, and stick with it. Don't go church hopping. Um, and uh, so I, one Sunday morning, I drove up the road 
stopped at the front of this church here and came in. Mm -hmm. And I've been here ever since. Um, when did I become a Christian? I can't exactly say. Some people perhaps can pinpoint a day and a time, but somewhere within three months before and three months after that, uh, coming to the church here, mm. I would say that I crossed the frontier, mm. as it were. Mm. Uh, looking back, I can say I've crossed the frontier, mm. but it was a progression. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I was baptized here in the middle of the year of that year, 1970, and uh, became a church member here. Uh, at about the same time, and I've been part of this uh, community, this uh, part of the family of God, mm. uh, here since 1970. That makes it uh, 53 years. Wow. Yeah. In that time, I've, uh, I've been involved in nearly all the activities of the church. I remember uh, one of our older men, he was 31 and I was 21, so he was a lot older. He seemed very old, <laughs> but he was running a boys' club here uh, on a weeknight, and uh, he asked me would I come and help him, and I did. And then I suggested to him, I thought he suggested it to me, but he he was sure that uh, I suggested it to him. I asked him, could I, uh, you know, do some uh, teach the boys something from the Bible, and and I. Uh, Pretty sure I started sketching about that time, mm. sketching and telling. And um, anyway, however it happened, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And so I began there. Before long, I was, I was teaching in the Sunday school, which was booming in those days. We had about 90 kids coming here. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it was a, a different age, a different culture from what we're used to now. So you know, I, I got involved in most everything. If, if something was happening, I wanted to be in it. Mm. And uh, when I discovered there was a uh, an old an old youth group that for people in my age range meeting here, uh, I wanted to be part of that too, and um, so you know I gradually got involved. I became a youth leader here in later years. Um, I met my wife here, and uh, that's a, that's an interesting another story. <laughs> but uh, it's probably I'll put it in here now. Um, People find it quite funny, and I suppose it was, but uh, we were both involved in the youth work and uh, we were good friends. Um, we'd been on a, a, a house party with kids from different churches uh, as leaders, and we had one girl we had to take back home. She lived out at Tarmall, which is quite a long way away. So we, we, I, I drove her home and Christine came as chaperone. Mm -hmm. And on the way back, I said to Christine something like this, you know, I've been thinking it'd be quite logical if we were to get married. And she also being a very logical person was speechless. And, <laughs> and in due time, we did just that. So- uh, It was the most logical thing to do. <laughs> it probably wasn't the most romantic way no. of doing it. <laughs> but uh, yes, we have a good laugh over that. And uh, say we've been married now 49 years. Wow. Um, I've been a deacon here, um, meaning you know, mainly responsible for the, you know, the, the material needs of the church, mm. uh, and also an elder, uh, lay preacher. Um, um, in later years, more and more, I focused on uh, uh, you know, teaching the Bible to the children. Mm. Yeah, uh, and you I do a really, doing. you do a really good job mm. um, in doing that, and I really appreciate mm. your teaching Thank you. in that. Yeah. that way i do have a question though because you did mention that you just harking back to your uni years in your in the in your hippie phase yes how you um, enjoyed a sense of community yes with that group. yes very much yes and so how is church how is church different how is christianity different to i guess the ethos and the print the shared principles that you you enjoyed ah. with your Hippie friends. Those, I, hmm, I've never been asked that question. Certainly, both were communities, and uh, um, and, and that was that is vital. I mean, we're made for community. That's one thing I'm, I've I've learned over and over and over. You know, to be alone, to be without community, is a horrible thing. 
and so many people are in that. You know, they're, they're busy. They might have work contacts, uh, work colleagues, uh, but but very little in the way of community. Mm. So uh, it's very very valuable. The difference I think would be that our community was in the hippie world was based on uh, a myth, uh, and that was that uh, you know we could all behave. Uh, um, you know, wonderfully and care for one another, and it didn't always work that way. Uh, in the church, of course, it's made of fallible people, and it, but there is a sense of community because it's built upon a foundation that's not shifting around like in the hippie time. Anything goes. Uh, it's built upon the foundation of knowing that uh, there is someone who gives meaning to the universe, who made it all that uh, he's not only great out there, but he's close in here. Mm. Uh, he's near to us. He loves and knows us and cares for us. And on that basis, and the basis of what he works within us, changing us bit by bit, uh, there is real community, I suppose. That's how I would think of it, mm. uh, lasting community. Mm. Uh, we don't always like one another. That's not the same as loving one another. You know, we can rub one another up the wrong way at times, and we can apologise if it's needed. And we can still act in that way of love, helping one another. Mm. And, and that's, I suppose, the big difference. It's community built upon God himself, mm. and therefore it's, it's got a sure foundation and it's got a sure destination. Mm. Somewhere, it's going somewhere. So. And, and I like what you said about how the belief in hippie culture is that people can behave mm. um, and people can get along, but it didn't always work out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that fun, fundamental premise that people can't change, right? People can't change mm. who we mm. are. Mm. But then when you just explored Christianity and you became a Christian and you, you know, called on Jesus to save you and to, to change you, mm. um, like, you can see over many decades of how Christ has changed you. Yes. Is, 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 is that true? Is that an accurate yes. statement? Yes, I think it is. Um, there are different seasons of life, of course, but, but looking back, definitely, I, I think I'm a much, uh, what's the word, more pleasant person than I could be. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, you know, the work's not complete, though. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, our Lord Jesus has said it will be complete in this life. He said that uh, he is building his church and his church is made of individuals and he's building them. Mm. Uh, building new ones in, uh, uh, continually renovating those who are already in. Mm. Mm. And, um, and, and that's what goes on, yes. Um, it's when I was younger, I knew that a younger Christian, I knew that humility was a great virtue that we ought to have. Looking back, I didn't always show it. Uh, I still had my moments, but in the main, I, I, I think that, yes, that, that the Lord has uh, made lots of changes. Mm. There's a verse, I can't remember exactly where it is. <laughs> you can see an Isaiah somewhere, but it talks about, uh, having reached the stage where one knows that in yourself we are nothing but in in Christ that we are precious to him mm. so um, yeah yeah and it's interesting that you mention that we don't always get along mm. but we love each other mm. nevertheless mm. and I think mm. one of the misconceptions people have about church and Christianity is that we always get along or that we're all perfect people mm. but in reality um, the church is made up of people who are flawed and mm. still sinful like we still do wrong mm. but what would you say the the main difference is between those who are Christians and are in church and those who are trying to I guess do good um, outside of church the main difference hmm 
I think I'll go back to Lewis here. Um, over the years, I keep reading Lewis, so I guess I'm sort of steeped in him. Uh, he makes the point, again, I can't put my finger on where, but that we mustn't judge by outward appearances. You know, we don't know, you know uh, how much that uh, person who is a Christian, but maybe a bit grumpy at times, how much grumpier they'd be if they weren't. And we don't know how much that uh, person who is not interested in a life of faith, uh, and yet, you know, is one of those who does lots of good works, who is cheerful to be around. We don't know how much of that is a natural disposition, the gifts they were given in their makeup. We don't know what inner troubles the, 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 the Christian you know, who's not so cheerful to be about uh, has had to face and still faces. Mm. So we really know no position to judge. Uh, only God can judge the heart. So what's the difference? Um, faith in someone else and reliance on someone else. Uh, a person you know, of a, a naturally cheerful and uh, uh, hospitable disposition could be doing all manner of good works, and they are good, you know, caring for the poor, caring for the sick, uh, volunteering in umpteen different organisations, uh, all good things. But you know, it, that's not you know, how we are reconciled to God. All of us have done things wrong. Um, I don't think there'd be too many people that would put their hand up and say, I've never done anything wrong. And I think they'd be rather misguided if they did. Uh, so all of us fall short of our own standards. Um, you know, none of us are as kind and as generous, as gentle, uh, as truthful uh, as we think we should be, um, regardless of whether we're a, you know, a, a cheerful, helpful person or not. So it's, it's something quite different. Mm. You know, it's something outside us is needed to reconcile us to God. It can't be anything to do with uh, the fact that I... I'm a, uh, a good person and I do lots of good things. Mm. Uh, that's great in itself, but you know you also uh, are not as good as you think you are and there's lots of good things you don't do probably and some bad things that you do do. Mm. So uh, it's, 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 I suppose it's not, a, it's not a fair contrast in a way. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's talking lot, talking apples and oranges type thing. Yeah. Mm. I think what I'm getting at there is that you know, Christianity isn't a performative um, religion. Mm. Like it's yes. it's not a yep. something that you do mm. because you you rightly say there are people who aren't Christians who are probably mm. far more of a better disposition mm. <laughs> than mm. than Christians. Mm. So it can't be based off our own internal um, desire and willingness to do good. We need something outside or someone outside mm. of us. Yes. to do that good for us. And yeah. I guess this is what Christianity is all about, right? Like we believe that Jesus mm. did that work, that good work mm. on the cross to mm. live the life that we couldn't yeah. live. In my uh, hippie days, I dabbled, uh, explored lots of isms, um, including Eastern religions, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, um, Everything but Christianity, in fact, <laughs> I explored. Uh, occultism, all sorts of isms. Uh, all of them were essentially based on your performance. I mean, among the Eastern religions, uh, including Hinduism and Buddhism, the principle of karma is one of the major things. You know, the good you do and the bad you do are weighed up at the end of life. Uh, and if the bad outweighs the good, you might come back as a grasshopper. Mm. If the good outweighs the bad, you might come back as a prince, mm. uh, something like that. But it's all based on performance. And, and nearly all the world's religions are somehow rather mixed up with that. The ancient Egyptians uh, had something very similar. The soul after death on its voyage through the underworld would come to a point where it was weighed in the balances mm. to see whether it's, uh, its heart was... Now, someone would have to correct me here. Was its heart heavier than a feather or was lighter than a feather? I think maybe if it was lighter, uh, a nothing, mm. then it would be sent to uh, into the darkness or something like that. 
So it was again, you know, a balancing act, this idea that the good and the bad, uh, and if the good outweighs the bad, then I'm, I'm doing okay. Mm. Uh, whereas the Christian faith says, you'll never reach that position where the good outweighs the bad. Um, it doesn't work like that. Mm. Um, someone else has to work it out for you. Mm. Um, someone uh, has said that there are only two religions in the world, uh, four letter and two letter. The two letter ones are, are there by the thousands and it's called do, mm. do, 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 do. There's one that's four letter and it's done. Mm. Someone else has done it. And, mm. and that uh, is you know, Jesus our Lord, mm. God's son. And it's on that that we have all our hope. Mm. So that's the distinction. That is a massive distinction. Mm. Um, and it puts a lot of, it puts you at rest, doesn't mm. it? Mm -hmm. It's, you're not stressed yes. about your performance yes. and what you do. Yes. Obviously as Christians, we're commanded to do good. Mm. But that's a result of what Christ has done for us. It's, mm. a, it's a response, yes. right? It's not us trying to work our way up the mountain, so to speak. Yes. Have I done enough good things? Mm. Uh, uh, and the answer will always be no, uh, unless a person completely self-deluded. <laughs> uh, whereas for the Christian, they can say, I haven't, but he has. Mm. And, uh, and that's what makes all the difference. And that's so important. And, and this leads me to... Um, the next question, I mean, how has Christianity influenced your, your life thus far in these many decades? Mm. <laughs> how do you sum that up? <laughs> um, well, hmm. the idea of being a success um, is something that's very attractive and we all want to be successful at something. Um, I did graduate uh, from engineering and it was after I was a Christian. I went back and, uh, start and, and took up where I left off studying part-time. But uh, I quickly learned that, that other things were more important. Uh, so uh, you know, Kristen and I were married for, let me think, four years before we had our first child. Uh, when he was just a little baby, still in hospital with mum, um, uh, I had to go up to a, a coal mine up uh, past the Blue Mountains at, in the middle of the night to look at some machinery that had uh, failed, that the company I worked for was, uh, well, we manufactured the equipment. And I was the engineer in charge of that equipment. So it was a great job, wonderful job for a young mechanical engineer. But there I was leaving my wife in hospital uh, driving through the night to go up to this coal mine, coming back in seven in the morning, uh, sleeping in the car because I couldn't drive safely, and then going back to work uh, for the day. And uh, I thought, this is not so good. Mm. Uh, when he was only a few months old, there was some other equipment of ours that we'd sold to a, a, a big mining company up in Queensland that wasn't working as uh, required. And uh, so I spent two weeks up there uh, in a mining camp uh, with my wife at home with the baby. My wife was, had uh, problems with her wrists that needed surgery. So she was bandaged up mm. after the surgery with a baby to look after. And I thought, this is not going to work too well. And so I began looking for another job. So there was a change. You know, this was the, the plum job, you know, the wonderful place for a young engineer. I had involvement in so many facets of engineering. It was, it was stimulating but exhausting. So I went looking for a quieter job and ended up working out at the Kernel Oil Refinery, mm -hmm. which I figured at the time would be a bit humdrum. Um, I built it 25 years before, surely the bugs have gone now. It's all been fixed. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work like that. So it, was, it turned out to be a stimulating job too, but I didn't know that at the time. So there were those things where you make a decision based on uh, ideals and desires that are quite counter to what you would have if you were just by yourself. Mm. I suppose that's one factor there. Um, you learn to let go of things. I, had, I started learning that you know, after I, I suppose I passed, I reached my peak probably when I was mm, 
probably about 50, I suppose. And, uh, and, and then I had to start uh, letting other people do things, as it were. You know, my areas of expertise, were, um, where I was an expert, uh, you hand them over to other people. Mm -hmm. So there's willingness to let go. And I think as, as I get older, that's more and more part of my thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you, you let go of your work. I had the idea that uh, when I did retire, they might want me back as a consultant because people often had that experience. They didn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind. <laughs> you know, I've been busy enough since anyway. Um, your own health. Um, your, uh, as you get older, different things start to break down and uh, you realise that you're not what you used to be. Mm. And that's okay. Mm. Uh, learning that is a valuable life lesson. So is, is this somewhere like what you're thinking? Yeah, about? yeah. And so how has, yeah. I guess, your faith um, influenced these, these key areas? How have you, I understood, you know, mm. or thought about like your health or Mm. Definition of success, letting things go. Mm. The... Mm. Yeah. Trying to think, how does it affect me now? Or how, how did you think about it as you were going through, um, through them? I think with, with acceptance. Mm. You know, um, I remember when I started as a mechanical engineer, I had an interest in computing and um, we started putting computers in and um, I got involved with building computer rooms and the like uh, as a mechanical engineer, so, but I got involved with that. And um, there, there came a point where um, you know, we decided to network the whole refinery. PCs were prol proliferating around the place. We had maybe 200 at that point. And um, so, I convinced management it was the time to put a network in, which we did, and it expanded to more than double that number of computers in all facets of life. Everything changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the offices changed. Each, each person's office or cubicle, when, if they didn't have an office, which most people didn't by then, open plan being the thing, was, was focused on the computer in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it revolutionized everything. Uh, but, uh, and it was stimulating, but there came a point when as we expanded our network, we upgraded over the years, uh, we merged with another oil company, and um, so we had to merge our systems, and I was involved in that, uh, and that was great. Um, but as I was getting older, not too many years off retirement, we had to do another major upgrade, and the technology had moved on. Uh, sure, I mean, the, the stuff I knew was still relevant, but at a lower level, there was all this more complex stuff, layers upon layers. And so I, I specified the work to be done, and I left it to the younger blokes to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it went very smoothly. But that was one area where, you know, from being the network expert, I just became the, the old expert that sort of, <laughs> you know, watched from the, <laughs> watched from the, uh, the sidelines. <laughs> and that was okay. Mm. Yeah, you know, that, that was all okay. There were other things to do. So uh, I think that's part of it. Mm. Um, then again, you know, I was an elder in the church for a while. Um, I'm even elder now. <laughs> but uh, um, there came a time when, you know, I was suffering with some mental health issues. Mm. Now, as a Christian, before that, I, I, poo-pooed the idea that a Christian could have mental health issues. You just have to have enough faith. Well, you know, the Lord had lessons for me. There's learning to be gone through there. And uh, at that point, I, I became quite sure that I should retire from being an elder. And uh, I was also church secretary at the time as well, uh, because it clouds your judgment. And so and, and I, I don't regret that decision. Um, it would be nice not to be sick, but uh, I think it was the right thing to do at the time. And, um, and, and just moving on and accepting those things, accepting that Christians can have mental illness. Mm. Uh, I remember uh, you know, our, our, our recently retired pastor, Matt, Matthew, Matt Murray, uh, 
he doesn't remember this, but he preached on Elijah many years ago, uh, Elijah the prophet, and how after the great victory over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and how uh, with really superhuman strength, he was able to uh, uh, run to the capital city uh, as fast as the, uh, the king could flee in his chariot. And when he got there, uh, the queen came out to him and said, I'm going to have you fed to the dogs. And he just fell apart and, uh, and really into depression. And uh, I thought, wow. I remember feeling when I heard that, uh, that, how can I say, I felt part of that brotherhood mm. in a way, though I didn't realize that, that it was strictly a mental illness mm. at that time, and that can be for many things. But you know, I'm glad in retrospect that uh, the Lord has put those people in the Bible mm. with their failures and strengths and uh, uh, as an encouragement to us. We're not alone. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there's, there's many things that you, you learn as you go, mm. I think, and for me to learn that, uh, that one, that Christians can have mental illnesses, in mine, it turned out to be what's called obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and I had really not much idea about that at all. But um, you know, I asked my, it was getting so dreadful for me, uh, a, a dreadful feeling of responsibility for my actions and how they might affect others over the most minute and trivial things. Mm. And um, it was agony and um, mental agony. and. Um, so I asked to see a psychiatrist and he listened to me uh, ramble on and ask some questions and then said, I think you've got obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm. And we began treatment and I thank God for uh, both the strategies for managing it and the medication for managing it. Mm. Uh, it's been quite transformative for me. So there are lessons to learn. Uh, and so whenever I you know, come across a Christian that uh, seems to be having some mental health problems, I certainly pray for them. And uh, if I can you know, get alongside and give them some advice and encouragement, I'd look, I like to do that too, because it's a bigger problem than we think. A lot of it's, uh, um, you know, I say mechanical, brain chemistry, uh, or genetic. Uh, you know, we're, we're not only uh, as human beings fallen morally, mm. um, we're also you know, the results of a long period of decay. Mm. You know, we, we know that, uh, uh, that, that certain things get genetically passed down and there are gene, or, or gene errors and so on, mm. photocopy errors as it were. Mm. So it shouldn't surprise us. Mm. Uh, Christians are not immune to any disease. Mm. Now we're reaching the end of our, our interview here so you've you've been a christian mm -hmm. uh, for a long time what what keeps you going in your faith remembering remembering lots of things remembering how good the god has been to me through all these years how the things that he's uh protected me from um probably things I don't even remember, but uh, uh, that he's never let me down. And uh, you know, my wife and I, we, um, we wanted to stay in the vicinity of the church because we were so involved in it. At that time, that was very difficult, just as it is now, uh, to afford. But uh, we were just able you know, to find a house that we could barely afford <laughs> and we're still living in it. Mm. Uh, where, when a, a lot of our friends of the same age were moving out to uh, you know, new housing estates uh, a long way off. And that's fine. I mean, they were, they were you know, joining churches out there and becoming seeds, as it were, for uh, other churches. But, uh, you know, there were lean times for us. We didn't have a lot of money uh, coming in and my wife's health wasn't good, so she had to give up work early. But you know, we've we've always managed, and in our retirement, we're doing we've we've actually done very well. So things like that, they're the material side, but also 
you know, the, the sustaining of me through that period of uh, mental ill health, um, from uh, uh, overruling my mistakes along the way, some of them related to that uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, for being with us both uh, to the present. Uh, there are just so many things to remember and to be thankful for, but especially we, we you know, we, we're thankful and we remember the promises that he's given. Now, we aren't perfect, but one day he says he's going to make us so. How he does that, you know, uh, you know, all those things which the Bible points us to and our Lord's words point us to when he comes back, uh, when he welcomes us home, if we, as we probably will, uh, you know, uh, die in this life before he returns, uh, he's promised us a welcome and uh, into a place which is without tears, without sickness, without sin, without uh, failure, without sorrow of any sort, and um, which is filled with uh, delight. Now, our minds can hardly conceive of that, uh, but he has promised it. Nothing in this life uh, will be a match for what he has promised. And yeah, that comes straight from the Bible. So, uh, because it's beyond what we can imagine, we can't imagine it. Yes. <laughs> but we can look forward to it with hope. Yes, that's right. Mm. And the Bible's true and um, it mm. promises us this, mm. this hope mm. Mm. and we can trust in this hope. Yep. I remember hearing about uh, one of the early uh, Christians uh, in the early centuries. His name was uh, Chrysostom. I think it's Chrysostom is how you say it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he was 80 years old. And I may, my memory is going, so I may have got this slightly mangled, but I think he was you know, uh, about to be martyred for his faith in those uh, days of the Roman Empire. And uh, he said something like this, 80 years I've served him and he's never done me any harm. Mm. I just remember that. Mm. But, uh, we might have perhaps have expressed it a little more forcefully. Mm. He's done me nothing but good. Mm. But uh, yeah, that's what he meant. Mm. And I think that that's the thing that we, we hang on to. You know? You know, that there is priceless treasure promised to us through our Lord Jesus, mm. which fulfills all the needs, all the longings that we ever have. All those longings ultimately point to him. And we just get a, a small foretaste here, right? Mm. Um, yes. Here on yes. earth. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. So to to wrap this up, you know, we we've had a long journey through mm. your entire life and you know, lead, your early years to your teen years, to your mm. uni years, your marriage years, and now through your senior years. And all the, the questions you've had and challenges you've faced. So what advice would you give to two people, two kinds of people? Um, firstly, what about those who are asking questions about Christianity? Um, what advice would you give to them? And perhaps to Christians who are people who are already Christians mm. and they're continuing their, their walk um, mm. as a Christian, mm. what advice would you give to these two types of people? To a person who was, I suppose, seeking to find the answers to life, um, was aware of an emptiness uh, that they couldn't fill um, at, at some point in their life, I would, I suppose I would, I would want them, I would, recommend them to read the Bible. They don't have to read the whole lot. They don't have to do what I did, which was start at Genesis. And, <laughs> uh, uh, by the time I, I got my wheels well and truly in the mud in uh, the book of Leviticus <laughs> and decided that it's best to start at Matthew's Gospel. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I've been back since to all of it, but uh, you know, read the Gospels. You know, read the account of this man, Jesus. Uh, how he's depicted, uh, what he claimed for himself, what he did, uh, the sort of person he was, and and see what you think. Mm. Uh, um, yeah. We have more evidence for the life of Jesus than we have for almost 
well, for any other character in ancient history. Mm. Um, we have very little about people like uh, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, mm. um, but we have loads and loads and loads of historical uh, material on the life of Jesus. Read it. Mm. I guess that's one thing I would heartily recommend to them. Don't you know, read it alongside of other if you like. That's no problem if you haven't read already. You know, if you haven't looked at the alternatives, mm. um, but do look at that. Mm. You know, it struck me looking back that that in my searches in those hippie years, I was an ABC, anything but Christianity, and I would say, don't be an ABC. Mm. You know, look, have a look, mm. um, and uh, that's what the Bible says. You know, it says, seek and you will find, said Jesus. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and it will be given. Um, just come in sincerity saying, you know, if you're there, God, show me mm. as I read through this, your word. Mm. So I think that'd be the most important thing. And, and you did that and it changed your life, didn't mm. it? Yes, mm. yes. How about to Christians? Um, well, harking back to the willingness to let go of things, um, I would say, you know, learn, practice contentment with what you have. Um, put um, you know, your Christian faith first and foremost. Um, accept you know, that some things you can't do. I mean, it's right to accept our own limitations. I mean, the Bible teaches that. You know? It says not all are going to be uh, eyes in the church, not all are going to be ears, not all are going to be mouths, not all are going to be feet. Um, not everyone has the same abilities. So be yourself in that environment. Don't expect from yourself that which uh, you know, God hasn't made you to be. Uh, it's one of the psalmists says, I would rather be a a doorkeeper, you know, the man that opens the door you know, in the house of my God uh, than anywhere else. Mm. So if you, know, if you think your role is minor, cherish it and think, well, if this is what God's given me, I'll do it for his glory. Mm. Um, we're willing to let things go as you get older, um, things that you did once you won't be able to do, uh, physically as well as uh, mentally. Uh, I certainly find that uh, my mind isn't as nimble now as it was uh, years ago. Um, certainly my body isn't as nimble as it used to be. Um, I'm, I'm looking for a good home handyman at the moment to do the jobs that I shouldn't be doing, <laughs> especially things that mean climbing ladders. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, accepting them and letting things go. I'd offer you, but I'm... Not a handyman. <laughs> That's all right. There's it's probably a few safer around. for you to go up than for me to go. There's around. a few of them up. Yeah. And I wouldn't want the responsibility of you up a ladder anyway. <laughs> so what else would I say? Uh, hold on to that which is most precious. Um, I'm I'm doing the kids' spot on Sunday morning, and uh, I'm I've decided that the appropriate thing for what you're preaching on will be the the hidden treasure. So you know, the man in the field, digging in the field, comes upon a hidden treasure mm. and it sells everything he has to buy that treasure, to buy the field. You know, uh, that should be the centre of our lives as Christians. Mm. Uh, it doesn't mean we need to buy fields. It doesn't mean we need to sell everything we have. Mm. It means that we should put the greatest priority upon knowing and loving and worshipping our Saviour Jesus and uh, serving him as we can in this life, whatever that means. Mm. And that may mean when we get old, I remember an elderly lady in our church that uh, went home to the Lord a few years back. Uh, I mean, she'd been a, a busy person all her life, you know, the matron of a, a, a nursing home um, and uh, among other things. And here she was, a little bent over lady that uh, uh, couldn't do much at all, and sometimes she would fall asleep in church. But she was such a sweet character, and I remember that. Mm. I remember. So I, I 
I pray the Lord will help me to be a sweet character when I get to that situation. And uh, uh, so even in old age. Amazing. Thank you, Steve, for your time. Mm. And yeah. it's been a pleasure.